I am happy to have Automotive Seminars as a sponsor for the show. Now, if you're not familiar, Automotive Seminars is a diagnostic technician training company. They've got a website that there'll be a link to in the show notes. And what they offer is top-notch training to technicians like us in the field. I've been taking their training courses for years and have got a ton of benefit out of it. They've got top-notch instructors, John Thornton, Scott Shotton, Scott Manna, and every other month, they've got a two-night course that you can sign up for. Join in, ask questions, and afterwards, you've paid for the course, you can access a recorded version whenever you want. You can rewatch the class two years later in case you wanted some details on it. And that is a fantastic feature. So make sure to check out the website to see what courses they have available and what's coming up in the future. This podcast is brought to you by Jarhead Diagnostics. Jarhead Diagnostics manufactures in-house diagnostic equipment and storage solutions, as well as distributes for companies like Pico, ATS, and Topdon. One of my favorite tools that I have bought from Brandon and Jarhead Diag is the case for the U-Scope. If you don't have a U-Scope, you probably should, but if you have one, you got to get one of these 3D printed cases, has a magnet on it, has a full-size BNC lead that you can connect to, and it gets rid of the weak point of that scope, which is the mini BNC connection, which is pretty fragile. This case makes this thing nice and secure and makes it an even better tool than it was. So check out jarheaddiag.com. The link is in the show notes. This episode is brought to you by L1 Automotive Training and Keith Perkins. If you're looking for education on module programming, J2534, EEPROM work, key and immobilizer, electrical diagnostics, or drivability diagnostics, Keith has a website, l1training.com, that's got over 60 hours of training videos on all those subjects and more. When I first started out doing mobile, I utilized Keith's videos on module programming in J2534 in order to get my head wrapped around what I would need for the tooling, the computers, the software setups, you know, what kind of obstacles I would be up against when I'm out there programming modules on cars. And it was a huge benefit to me. And I continue to use the training videos um, that he has on his website. So I strongly recommend checking out l1training.com. We have got Auto Rescue Tools and Isaac Rodell as a sponsor for this podcast. Hey guys, if you're looking for programming laptops, you want the laptop set up ready to go for programming control modules on vehicles, you need key cutting equipment, you need diagnostic tools, Isaac is your guy. Has all that stuff available for purchase and the support that he offers along with the purchase has been outstanding. I bought some stuff from him in the past. I got my Dolphin key cutting tool from him several years back. And again, the support has been phenomenal. Helped me out along the way with anything additional I needed to make it work for me. Also for the month of June, 2023, they've got Autel updates for sale. So make sure to check that out as well. Again, that's autorescuetools.com. The link will be in the show notes. Welcome to the Automotive Diagnostic Podcast. We're going to explore ways to sharpen our diagnostic skills, find learning resources, and hear from experts in the automotive field. Hey, what's going on automotive world? Welcome to another episode of the Automotive Diagnostic Podcast. My name is Sean Tipping. I'm going to do that host thing again for you today. Joining me on the show today is Daryl Cawhorn. Daryl is a technician, diagnostician, educator, um, all around really great and smart guy. Um, He's pretty active on a lot of social media groups, so you might be familiar with him already. Uh, But if not, you're going to be after this. He's going to let us in on his story, how he got 
into this industry and how he got to where he's at now. And then we're also going to discuss some things like training, education, bettering yourself, helping other people in the industry, all really good stuff. Um, I really enjoyed this talk and uh, I hope we can have uh, Daryl on again at some point. But with that out of the way, let's jump in. So um, I actually ended up fixing the, well, not me personally, but I did get the Honda thing finally working that you were helping me with the other day. <laughs> well, that's good. Yeah, that's great to hear. Yeah, and I think I'm getting refunded for the for the three that they charged me for, and that I didn't three, get subscriptions wow. for some thing. Okay, <laughs> yeah, because I tried. I don't know if I tried two or three different web browsers. I know I tried two different payment methods, so one with a card, one with PayPal, and they billed me every time. Like there was no delay on the billing; <laughs> it was immediate. But I never got the actual subscription. Um, and even when I found, I think you sent me the download link, it still wouldn't let me finish it because you had to put your login info right. and it said yeah, it asked for I your, didn't have a your subscription. Active login, username and password that has uh, the script to it. And if you don't have anything attached, then you're not getting past that screen. Yeah. So the solution was, and this came from their email, uh, the tech support email, was to make the purchase through Internet Explorer, which that's not one I tried. Um, so I did that. It still didn't show up on the list, at least not right after I did it. But when I went back in, you know, to do the actual software download, then the password and user ID worked and it, it finished it for me. So, okay, good. Anyways, eventually got through that one. So I can, I can do Hondas now. I just never seem to get calls on Hondas for some reason. Cause the last one I did for an update was two. 2018, so it's been quite a while since I've <laughs> updated a Honda for some reason. Well, um, Daryl, um, how, how do I pronounce your last name? I think I know, but I want to make sure I'm getting it right. We pronounce it Callhorn. It's said a little differently than it's spelled. Technically, it's Karen, like C-A-W-R-O-N okay. is how you technically pronounce it. But we've always just pronounced it Callhorn. So we pronounced it wrong in our entire lives okay. and just left it. <laughs> <laughs> just you know, go with it. All right. I like that. Um, so I'm trying to think. I've been at least friends with you on Facebook for quite a while or interacting yeah. with you on Facebook for quite a while. Um, I was thinking back to – and maybe you still do this somewhere – I'm not quite as active on Facebook as I used to be, but you used to have some like interactive case studies that you'd put up in some of the technician groups. And, yep. uh, those, those are really fun. I, I remember a couple you did one with, uh, it was like a Saturn sky or something with a camera locker that moved or something. Those, those are a blast. Yeah. That was a, um, what was that? Uh, Saturn or no, it was a, not a Pontiac Sun or not a Sunfire. Um, was it a Saturn Sky? A little two liter uh, turbo. Was engine. it a Solsus? Okay. Uh, it was a little two door convertible. Maybe it was a Saturn Sky. Um, okay. Anyway, I uh, yeah, that was a good one. And thankfully, how I got uh, was able to resolve that one at the time. I had found a known good waveform from is actually from a Vauxhall insignia. Um, I had same engine, same two liter turbo. And I looked on the, the Pico waveform library. I looked on IETN, um, either I overlooked it or it wasn't there, but I happened to find one, um, with that same engine code and compared it. And that's by looking at that waveform, uh, this guy had been working on this thing for over six months, just slapping parts on it, um, high pressure pump, injectors, ignition coils, uh, spark plugs. Um, they apparently had the time and cover off. They were down to the point of doing time and chains and uh, it wouldn't have fixed anything. The sure. we were able to quickly verify it took, we spent maybe 30, 45 minutes or so uh, diagnosing this one, getting some captures going in cylinder. I turned one bolt on the, or one bolt and one spark plug on the car. All we did for diagnosis and was able to nail it down, um, to give them enough information to say, Hey, you need to 
open this up, uh, see the internals, go by this TSB for a P0016. Uh, since the battery went dead, all the codes have been cleared out of it in memory. And if the engine had only ran, um, the code setting criteria for a PO or P0016 is running at least 600 RPM for, I think, 30 or 60 seconds. So it has okay. to have been running for X amount of time and it wouldn't do that. So it had no codes. There's no codes, crank, no okay. start. Had nothing to go off of other than doing some manual checks. And that was that was a fun one. Yeah. Um, I remember going through that with you as you were explaining it and asking questions and stuff. And the cool part about it was that you had enough confidence without taking anything apart, right? If it was me, I, I'd be pulling the valve cover and looking at that stuff, but I think it was the in cylinder and the the known good that you had. There was no question what had gone down. It, you know, it had to be that that reluctor had slipped on the back of the camshaft, and I thought that was pretty cool. And I've actually seen a couple of those in years since you you posted that. So it, um, it's one of those things where you go through it, you know, in a learning situation like that, it sticks with you and um, makes makes quick work of it once you actually run into one you're like oh i know what's going on here i know exactly yep. what to look for too so yeah. when you can pretty cool stuff when you can say i've seen this before i remember that this guy talked about it, and this is what he did hey it's the same thing i got um the biggest thing about about that whole case study was being able to follow a procedure you have a plan of attack know your equipment know how to use it and take a squiggly line on the screen of the scope and have it make sense. What is it telling you? And that's where I see a lot of people struggle. I, I struggled. I've, I remember me being at that exact point, me learning how to use this type of equipment. And I'm so glad that I stuck with it because it's done nothing but benefit me and help me along the way. Definitely. Um, well, how about we go with that? How did you get to where you're at and also i guess explain that for all the listeners what do you do right now wherever you want to start there okay i'll start at the beginning um right now 36 and my entire life grew up around nuts and bolts um uh, riding four wheelers with my dad and brother and working on them learning to wrench and getting the getting the bug uh you know at a very very early age and um right you know, high school took automotive mechanics, uh, all four years and right out of high school, went to a, a tech school at NASCAR technical Institute in Mooresville, North Carolina. And it was a great school. Um, I learned a lot there. There was a lot of good people there, made a bunch of good friends, great material. Um, I graduated near the top of my class, had a four O GPA, um, had a few tardies, that was it. Uh, several nominations, several student of the course awards. And um, not to say that in a, in a bragging sense, but um, I went there and I applied myself and I tried my best to make the very best of myself out of that situation. And unfortunately, I did see a lot of people that went through the school and did not choose to do the same thing. They were there just to get away from mom and dad to be in a different scenario. And it's like, they weren't taking it serious, but I was there to, yeah. to begin my career and make the best out of it. And I didn't worry about anything else. So, um, right out of there, moved back home, got the first job offer, um, that I applied for. It was at a Ford dealership and it was the only Ford dealership in the area that, um, worked on the, there were Celine distributors. So like the, that's 281 Mustangs. And, uh, okay. that's kind of what attracted me to them. Cause you know, I'm, you know, 19, uh, almost 20 years old and I love some cool cars. So, uh, sure. I wanted to go there and, and have some fun. And that started my, my professional career working in the field and it's been a few years there, um, decided to move on. And this is where I started throwing a little bit of variety in, um, I took a job working for a construction company, but in their race car shop. It was a construction company that had their own uh, dirt lake model racing team. 
and it okay. was a lot closer to home. So I took that job, um, spent a, spent a couple years there. Um, I was half of the pit crew <laughs> for the, for the team, <laughs> and one other guy. And, uh, but it was fun. Got a lot of experience. Um, because in NASCAR tech, I had not only the, the core automotive classes and the Ford facts, the Ford accelerated credential training classes in my belt, but I also had, uh, six different phases of fabrication skills. So sheet metal fabrication, welding, chassis applications, uh, dyno, all that stuff. And I still continued to use those skills I'd built. And during that time, um, got to meet a lot of, a lot of contacts, new people. And, um, that, that uh -huh. was actually the only job I ever got fired from though. And it's okay. kind, of a, kind of an odd story. It's, um, uh, long story short, they were expecting me to be somewhere doing something. And I was, I was in the pits cleaning up after we had repaired the car from a wreck. And, um, I wasn't down there cleaning the windshield. This is when we had a, um, they bought a, uh, was it a late model asphalt car and started running some okay. of those cars and they, the owner got upset. I wasn't cleaning the windshield and I was in the, you know, in the pits, picking up tools and putting stuff up. I was organizing and my OCD was, was going wild. And they let me, when we got back Monday, got the trailer and the car cleaned up Tuesday, um, get the car bolt checked and prepped and in service Wednesday morning, come in, they had a termination notice waiting on me. So, <laughs> uh, like, okay. Wow. So I went from there to, believe it or not, working at a daycare for about nine months while I look for something else. Um, but that was fun. If you want to, uh, if you want to learn some patience, go work at a daycare. <laughs> um, that's a, that's a skill set that a lot of people need. Sure. And I can only imagine. That, that was fun. You know, kids are great. And went from there i was i was honestly looking to go into the medical field because i had signed up to take some classes for emt and downside was that i didn't have the money up front to go and pay for the classes and i was at that age where the FAFSA there was no student loans available for for my age group for going back to school. I had to either be younger or older, and uh, mm. so I had to drop that idea, and ended up getting a call from a shop that a friend of mine that I or a guy that I became friends with when I first started working at Ford. He had went to the shop, and he knew I was looking for a job. I had him call me and good people. I took a job, worked there for, let's see. Yeah. I worked there for almost three years. Um, great place, good people. And that got me back in automotive doing automotive service, everything, uh, diagnostics, heavy truck repair and alignment, a little bit, of everything. That is where I first began really cutting my teeth on aftermarket scan tools, um, a variety of automotive makes and using an oscilloscope. When I went there, they had decided to purchase at that time is fairly new, but it was the first generation modus snap on modus and uh, had right. a big football shape button. So I was, I was interested in learning that and a few months later, I learned that um, a NAP Autotech training program was having a diesel summit, uh, basically four days of diesel classes covering Duramax, Power Stroke, Cummins. It was in Ohio, and I was like, do you guys want me to go to this? And they said, you want to mm -hmm. go? I said, I'll go. So they paid for my hotel and my food, and I drove my, my vehicle up, and... Um, Nice. That was the first real time outside of going to NASCAR tech. That was the first real time I got some really good training and it stuck with me from there. And All right. that was where I first really started getting interested in, um, learning how to use an oscilloscope and, uh, 
I never did, I never got the value of, of a scope until I had a 6.0 power stroke with a miss, with a crank, uh, it was a hard start, then a misfire. And okay. I never really learned the, the, the value of knowing how to use an oscilloscope until that vehicle. That was, that was a turning point. You know, everybody has a turning point and this one was mine. The, mm -hmm. um, the shop I was at then we had an IDS and, uh, we, you know, I was at the point where I was relying on it and using that relative compression test. I was like, this, this yep. has got to be, this has got to be good info. It's OE. Well, ran the test once. It showed one cylinder is low on compression. I'm like, okay. So just for kicks, I ran the test again, got a different result. I was like, well, what could be the case here? Different cylinder. Uh, this time all eight passed. They're all okay. eight green. Ran it a third time. It showed a different cylinder was long compression. Ran it a fourth oh. time, all eight pass. Ran it a fifth time, different result, different cylinder. And neither of those hmm. tests showed the correct problem cylinder. So okay. I grabbed the at this point, it's like, there's gotta be a different way to do this. And I'd heard, um, I'd heard some people do a relative compression test using a scope. So I grabbed, had a high amp probe, threw it around the battery cable. This is really the first time I, I tried it. And I tried using a cam crank waveform and that didn't get me anywhere on this one. However, when I threw that amp clamp around the battery cable, cranked it over, I saw something unique that I'd never seen before. And there was one hump that, and I've still got screenshots to this day. Um, I took pictures of the screen, plus I think I saved some screenshots somewhere. Um, but there was one peak that was 200 amps higher than the other seven. And it was repetitive. Okay. Eight events apart. It's like, well, got to find what this problem is. I mean, do we have extra compression or something else happening? So I went through a series right. of process and found that... Um, Long story short, uh, I was using cylinder cancellation tests, and when I turned cylinder two off, I noticed the popping and everything that was happening in intake would go away, and mm. um, when I kill when I kill the injector, the noise went away, and at that point, I was like, I got to go internal, so I got approval, took the valve cover off, and sure enough, the exhaust rocker arm for cylinder number two was split in half. And just laying there. Okay. And I was like, well, that's what, that's what the problem was. So why was that hump so much higher? Uh, is that cylinder having to work harder to compress it? And I thought about it. I was like, well, no. And it, it took me a little bit of figuring out, you know, in hindsight what it was, but it was a fact that the, that cylinder's paired cylinder was on compression at the same time when this one should have been exhausting. So now Sure. Two cylinders squeezing at the same time, and the starter's going to have to work harder. Then that's when it that's when it clicked. It's like, okay, that makes sense. That's so easy. And then, yeah, fast forward a few months, I got a Jeep three point seven with a constant misfire, and misfires on three and mm -hmm. six. Ran the same test. I got the same pattern, um, same type of pattern. One hump higher than the other five, and mm -hmm. this one I was able to do a sink using ignition trace it down to cylinder six not cylinder three but cylinder six the exhaust rocker kicked out off the cam follower so mm -hmm. that's when you know from then on i've learned to trust that test um far more or with with far greater weight than trusting scan data like scanner or scanner dander said in one of his recent videos you know never trust scan data um majority yeah. of time yeah you i mean it is processed data and you can't it's telling you what the computer thinks but it's not always right mm -hmm. yeah you want to have that in the back of your mind all the time that it is probably right but it might not be um it, it's funny you mentioned that waveform with the stuck uh closed exhaust and the the almost like double in height 
compression peak on the relative compression. Um, I, I use that with my students. Uh, we go through relative compression and that one I bring up at the end of the day, kind of as um, I put it as a challenge to them to try to figure out, okay, what's wrong with this? Here's the firing order. Here's what we have. Let's come up with some ideas because again, once you realize what's going on and you look at the partner cylinders and all that, you're like, okay, this makes total sense. But before that point, you really got to rack your brain to say, what's going on here but the example you used where you found the problem traditionally and then you correlated it back to what you saw in the waveform that's great advice for anybody for any test that you're using that maybe you're new to or you're not super familiar with is figure it out the way that you know how um and then go back and say why why did it look this way and then you're able to use that test in the future because you actually understand <laughs> what it's showing you right yeah, it's a it's a great way to prove a dis, prove or disprove a theory that you have. If you think you're right, then prove it. If you think you may be wrong, mm -hmm. prove it. There's a way to do that, and that's that's how it was for me on that one. Um, you know, I wanted to. I had what I thought was a conclusion. Turns out that I was wrong, and I learned something and learn what was the correct answer. So, um, but at that shop, I you know, spent a few years there and then got an offer to move over to another shop with another guy I used to work with. They were needing a good diagnostic guy. So um, I moved over there, took the offer, and uh, then we got some, some more equipment after me joining them. Um, and then they kind of, really grew from there. And then shortly after I started working there, I, uh, I finally had gotten a call to possibly come join the Napa auto tech training team. And this was something oh, cool. I had began discussing with the instructor that would come to Knoxville area at the time, um, talking with him about, you know, what's it take to, to be an instructor for the program? What's, what's it like? And, and how do I get in? And there was finally an opening that they have and they decided to give me a shot. And then this was, um, this was like three, three and a half years after me first asking, you know, some people give up after six months and I, I just, I kept hope up that maybe this would happen because <laughs> sure. I love, yeah, you know, I, I loved being in school. I love the, the education style of environment. I love seeing people learn and grow. And that's, that's part of my passion. And, um, it's, it's the show isn't, it, it's, the whole thing isn't about me. It's, you know, if I, if I acquire a skill, learn something, you know, I want to do everything I can to pass it on to somebody else and make their life easier. And that's what we should all do, um, in this field. Yeah. So I, I took them up and therefore, therefore a while I was, um, in the six and a half years I was with that shop, I was uh, also doing tandem with uh, with Autotech, being an instructor, um, along with working in the shop. So when I wasn't out somewhere teaching a class, I was in the shop um, getting information for case studies and um, applying the material that we were teaching and learning new ways to do things that I could talk to technicians in the classroom about when I go see them. And mm -hmm. that was a, that was a great combination. Um, so I got, I got to go all over with, uh, with jet, with that job. Um, I did end up leaving there end of, end of 2017. Um, due to some, uh, some conflicts with, uh, with other personnel that are no longer there. And, um, I went a different direction and, uh, went back to the shop full time for a little while and then uh -huh. got a, uh, a snap on rep that was coming by the shop. Then he had put me into a contact with the, uh, the regional diagnostic manager from in my area. So, mm -hmm. um, got on a phone call and got basically an over the phone interview um, for a position titled diagnostic sales developer. So basically the, the guy that's, that helps the franchise sell their diagnostic equipment. Um, okay. 
so fast forward about, you know, two months later, um, I accepted a job offer doing that and did that for a little over three years. And, uh, seems to be a pattern here, but <laughs> just like three years in a month is, uh, at that time I, I decided to, to leave that. I mean, that, that was okay. Um, it just wasn't for me. That, that was, that was one job I can definitely say didn't, there was no fulfillment for me in that job. Um, nothing exciting. Was it strictly sales? Uh, like Pretty, just dealing with shops? It was, it was a lot of sales. I, the part that I did enjoy was when I got to go to shop and, you know, talking to how to use their equipment. I got more out of that than mm. anything else. Um, okay. And, uh, you know, made some great friends, great contacts and, and was able to, you know, give customers a little bit different view of the step on diagnostic team than what they had, uh, you know, in, in prior times. Um, so that, so that went well and I covered a large area, large area, but that wasn't a job for me. I moved on, actually got an offer back with, uh, with Napa auto tech, um, doing curriculum development, which is where I'm at now. Uh, so writing, okay. writing the part of a team that writes the training classes and working on some new stuff right now. Um, along with, you know, making new relationships around here and, um, helping shops out with, uh, with some things when I can and growing my skill set. So from 2005 to, or 2003 till today, that's my storyline. So <laughs> awesome. So, so student dealer tech, um, race car shop, then daycare, independent, daycare, yeah independent, um, trainer, and then snap on diagnostics back to, uh, auto tech training, um, current day. Nice. Hopefully that was, and, uh, you do, no, no, that, that's great. And I, I have some questions on different things. Um, you do a little bit of mobile work too, right? Yes. Yeah. When, when okay. time allows. Right. Gotcha. Um, okay. Going back to the school, I had a question. I didn't want to interrupt you, but no, the, um, the, so the NAS, the NASCAR school, did you go to that school specifically? Like I want to be on a NASCAR pit crew. Is that the, no, is that the goal for everybody that attends that? Cause I don't know anything a, about a lot it. of people. A lot of people do. Um, this is going to sound weird, but when I went there, I wasn't interested in working for NASCAR. Um, I okay. went there for an automotive education and it was the closest one to me. Um, the next closest UTI at the time was down in Houston. Um, mm. I had also went, went out and toured Nashville Auto Diesel College, which is now Lincoln Tech. Um, I toured NADC and did an initial sign up. And then I was like, I want to go check out this net because NASCAR Tech was like a year old, I believe, um, or less than a year old at the time. So, um, I was like, I want to go check this out and see what it is. And as soon as I walked on campus, I was in love. I was like, this is, this is awesome. And I knew where I wanted to go to school at. If I was going to be serious about my future, this is where I want it to be. Um, okay. Now does someone have to do that to, to get to where I am or get to work where we are in this field? You know, no, um, it's going to take a lot of work, uh, from either way. And, uh, I had, uh, yeah, I decided to go that route and I think it, it did help me. It doesn't, it didn't teach me everything that I know today. Um, as soon as I graduated school, I knew I had a lot of learning still left to do. I had a core foundation and that was about it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, is it, um, is the curriculum similar to what you'd see in a regular, just basic automotive training program. I mean, obviously it's going to be different because it's NASCAR, but I mean, do they break down the car in the, in the same areas and go through suspension steering and here's the engine, um, you know, is that, is that all the same or is there, are there big differences in a school like that? Well, with it, with it being a division of UTI, um, the first 13 weeks are the core automotive curriculum classes. So, 
you start out with electrical, uh, um, or you got basic engines, then you had electrical one and two, uh, automatic manual trans, HVAC. Um, I did more electrical stuff than anything there, which is good. That was one of my weakest points. Um, that, that was my weakest area when I went to school because I knew basically nothing about electrical. Uh, okay. That's where, that's where I knew I had to improve if I was going to do this job. And so it was it was a core automotive classes and then um, the six phases of each phase is three weeks. So 18 weeks of NASCAR and then four four phases so another 12 weeks of uh, of the ford fact and all the ford fact was electrical electrical classes and uh the online training stuff so it was definitely more electrical than anything and uh yeah going when i went to school there i wanted to do automotive and i didn't want to work for nascar because i didn't i didn't want a traveling job <laughs> and that took okay. a, that took okay. a, that took an odd turn. I eventually ended up taking a job that, you know, put me all the way from Miami to Barrow, Alaska, and you know, <laughs> I've been been corner to corner of the United States. And you know, when I went to school, I said I don't want to travel. Yeah, yeah, that's that's super interesting. I, I've, I guess I don't, I don't even really consider that, or I haven't considered that as a career path for somebody. Maybe because we don't have anything like that around here, but I mean, it definitely would be. And it, it, it sounds like it sets you up pretty well, uh, you know, to go into any automotive sector. So that's, that's pretty cool. So you were saying that you enjoy the teaching side of things quite a bit with, uh, with Napa. What, uh, what kind of uh, courses or classes do you teach with them? Well, right now, uh, being curriculum development, we've got a whole other team that does instructing. Um, me and a few others are the ones that that write the curriculum. That's oh, okay. Being taught now. I gotcha. But when I in my time prior as in an, in an instructor position, um, we did all of them: uh, diesel, gasoline, um, hybrid class that we offered, uh, AC. Um, maintenance type classes. They had service advisor training classes. I never taught those because we had a couple guys that specifically did that. But any, you know, front to back, top to bottom, if it involved a vehicle, we had a class on it. I taught it. Okay. Yeah, I've been to a and few of those. Being in my position with being in, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I was just say I've been to a few of the Napa classes up around here, and always enjoyed them. Yeah, they're. Uh, They've definitely grown a lot from the first time I attended the Diesel Summit back in 2009. It was, in this, I think, in December of 2009. And how I remember it is the day that I left to go to the training, um, it was on a Sunday, and it was in Canton, Ohio. It says eight-hour drive for me, and it was my wife's birthday. Well, not – it was my – at that time, she was my fiancé. Um, it was her birthday and she wasn't very happy about that. <laughs> yeah. So, but, um, BF yeah, from, from there to now, I mean, it's, it's the materials changed. Uh, it's been a good change. Uh, enjoy what I do. Um, I get, it's kind of that thrill or that rush, I guess, when you see somebody apply what you've spent time trying to teach them they get it that light bulb goes off and then they begin using that because their life from here on just got easier yeah and you had a small part to do with that but whether they recognize that or acknowledge that later on it doesn't matter you help somebody and you keep going on keep helping other people and yeah it just makes your day better yeah no i i've always thought Maybe not always, but in the last five years or so, I've definitely realized like, wow, if you can change somebody's life, even just, even just a little bit where it kind of, it, it changes the trajectory of their career, at least maybe not even their whole life, but just their career. Like you're able to help them 
take that angle up just a little bit and they keep going and going and going, um, it ends up to be pretty significant over time. And yeah, it's, it's a really rewarding thing for anybody to be able to do that. Um, uh, that's yeah. T- that's why I, I think teaching is is fantastic. It's a lot of work, and you got to dedicate yourself to it, obviously. But um, it's yeah, it's it's doing good things for other people, and it's a it's a great thing. And I, I think once you get to a certain point in any industry or career, I think everybody should seek out that at least in a small amount, right? You don't have to be a full on teacher, but to give back to people somehow, some way so that they can yep. get to a good place too. Um, yeah. Some, some type of mentorship, um, position. There is, uh, the Facebook group, you know, the it's automotive, I think it's automotive mentors or I, I, I don't want to butcher the name of the group, but it's about mentoring other people coming up in the field. And I think that we should, you know, take on the responsibility of, of at some point in our career, taking that position of mentor and passing kind of that torch down, uh, as we can, you know, find one person, if it's just one, then so be it, but take what you've learned, invest it into somebody else, and then you'll see them, them follow suit. And it just helps everybody out. And it's a good, it's a good thing to do. Um, you know, with Facebook today, you can reach so many people so easy, so quick. Mm-hmm. When I was coming up as coming up through the field as a technician, um, didn't have that. So I we had we'll see, we had MySpace. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people probably thinking like, what the heck is that? <laughs> or we, you know, somebody comes on our page, you have a you have your favorite tune pop up and play. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we had those, those MySpace, and then I didn't join. I didn't get on Facebook until uh, um, my wife and I started dating. So that was 2008. Okay, but I didn't. I didn't get into any automotive groups until probably seven, eight years ago. So I don't know what what all existed prior to that. Yeah. But if, thinking back, if something like that had been available. When I was younger, if something like that existed. Oh man, how much how much different of a position, skill set wise, job wise, career wise, would I be in right now? Um, what would the field look like today if we could push today's social media availability back fifteen years, back twenty years? Right, where we can network with other technicians worldwide, share equipment skills, um, procedures, do this, do that, don't do this or do that Uh and avoid those traps and pitfalls and avoid problems that can be so easily created. How much better off would we be? It's something I don't have an answer to, (laughs) Yeah, but it's crazy to think about. And you know, you're not kidding. It's, um, boy, would it have been nice to have any of them back when I first started out, whether it be YouTube or Facebook or we had a ITN that, that was around when I was getting going. Um, and, and we had a subscription to that. And that was kind of like the beginnings of that because you could interact with people and, and seek out advice, but it's not, it's not quite the same as having it in your pocket. And like you say, just access to the world's knowledge and, and directly interacting with people. Like it, if you know somebody or you get to know somebody, you shoot them a message, they'll shoot you one back like that. Um, wow. That would have been really cool. Um, I mean, there's, yeah. there's something to be said for figuring stuff out the hard way, but boy, you waste a lot of time figuring stuff out on your own when <laughs> somebody can uh, kind of nudge you along and just say, well, yeah, maybe, maybe try it this way. See what happens or sort of guide you to the answer. Maybe not give it for you, but uh it, it's awesome for there's a great opportunity for a lot of people out there or young people uh, to take advantage of all that that you're talking about there and i love to see people regardless of age just wanting to learn wanting to improve themselves mm-hmm. um you mentioned ietn when i you know when i first joined it and i was reading some of the posts on there it started making sense while I was hearing it called the I ain't testing nothing network <laughs> instead of uh, yeah. what it is. 
but it you know it seemed to be that way and you know it's just a just a rolling joke but um social media whether it's youtube facebook you know i, I don't do anything on twitter or instagram and a lot of people do but i don't even fool with those but um the the online interaction on groups like iatn and all these groups i mean when when used properly mm -hmm. it's extremely powerful yep when used for a good purpose you can do a lot um but it can also do with a right or with the wrong mindset you can do a lot of damage really quick so you have to be responsible yeah about that type of stuff yeah for sure if you're shortcutting to every answer it's it's hurting you more than it's helping but um yeah the i i can so i got a question for you real quick yeah go for it what is your favorite tv show that you could sit down and watch if you had unlimited time boy what would that be so okay so i don't watch a whole lot of tv these and, days and why and why oh, okay all right um, I, I don't watch a whole lot of TV these days and I know there's a lot of good stuff out there, but I'll be honest. I just, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't had the time recently, so I'm going to go, I'm going to go way back to some other shows. And honestly, when I was growing up, um, I was a huge, well, okay. I'm still a big nerd, obviously I'm podcasting about diagnosing cars, but I was a big nerd growing up too. <laughs> and I was really, I was really into Star Trek. Okay. So, and people can make fun of me. Okay. I don't care. Um, it was, um, the next generation, the nineties one with, um, Patrick Stewart and that, um, I, I would turn that on right now and probably watch four or five episodes of it. Love that show. So that, that, that would be my pick. So uh, he, here's why, because, I, I like the science fiction side of things. I like the technology. I've always been drawn towards that stuff and they got spaceships and, you know, crazy computers and all that stuff, but they were, they were always trying to solve a problem right through the whole episode. And the problem would keep beating them. You know, they're, they're trying to overcome this obstacle and it looks like everything's going to go terribly. Yep. And then the last 10 minutes of the show, they solved the issue. Um, and then, you know, same thing next week, but it was always just, you're trying to think along the same thing. It's almost like a mystery. Like well, they're trying to get to the solution. What's the, how, how are they going to, how are they going to fix this problem? Um, and yeah, it was just, it was always very, very interesting to me. So that would be, that'd be my pick. I, I like that. Um, for me, uh, a show that I discovered and fell in love with right away is uh have you ever watched house md oh sure sure yeah fantastic house. um i love that show i've got i've got the whole season the eight season set of it so okay that's how much i like it that mainly because that show if you think about it is all diagnostics yep and it's about those problems that Nobody else could fix until it came to this guy. Mm -hmm. So whether it be, you know, what appears, well, it's, it's typically something that appears to be a, a super rare unsolvable case and ends up being something simple. We sure. can do, we deal with that same thing in automotive. Oh yeah. And then every once in a while, there's just, no matter how much you look at something, there there are some things. It's not that you can't diagnose it. It's just there are some things where you get to the point where you can't fix it without something drastic. Um, right. So, the, but the fact that it's dealing with with diagnostics and it follows a lot of theories. You know, they're they're up front. They got the interview. I mean, they're they're gathering information. You know, what's the symptom? Uh, what kind of problems you have and and then they, they're using their equipment to get some information. Mm -hmm. um, and then they have their, you know, kind of their own test drive process where they're doing some, some lab tests or, or whatnot to get some insight onto what the root problem could be. And then they go through some diagnostic workflow of, you know, try this, try that and see what the result ends up being. Um, 
it just if I think it follows along completely well with with what we do for sure um, in automotive diagnostics. Yeah, and it's all about problem solving. And for for whatever reason, maybe I'm a nerd. I'm 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 perfectly fine with that. I tell everybody <laughs> I'm a nerd from the hills of Tennessee, <laughs> and I'm completely fine with that. And but I just I just really like that show, and it's it's about oh, yeah. being investigative and you know, using problem solving skills and, you know, doing something that apparently a lot of other people can't do and being that go-to guy. The, the uh, other guys. thing, the other thing I liked about that show, right? So House Hughes, this brilliant doctor who always, you know, got to the solution and fix, fix a problem or diagnosed whatever, but he wasn't able to do it without his team of other doctors. And they'd sit down in the conference room and they'd, they'd write out stuff on the whiteboard, right? Like they'd bounce ideas off of him. And even if they weren't the right ones, it got him thinking about, oh, I need to go check this. And, you know, he'd do something and it, it, the problem was solved. But that he, even him, you know, this brilliant doctor, he needs those other people to connect with and to bounce ideas off of and to like mind map the stuff, right? Like let's put it out on a whiteboard and see where this gets us. And I mean, honestly, yeah. that sort of stuff <laughs> benefits us too if you actually take the time okay i'm getting beat up here let's let's do a mind dump here let's write this stuff out take a legal pad write it out or contact some other people too. bounce some ideas off of some colleagues be like i uh, you know i'm just getting my butt kicked by this thing what am i doing wrong and even if even if they don't give you the answer they they nudge you in the right direction they get you thinking about the right thing so that that part of it huge in our industry oh yeah yeah we've got to have a got to have a good team i mean not that you can't operate good as a one-man shop mm -hmm. not saying that at all i know a lot of people that do that and are, are great at it um but that the essence of networking and being in contact with others is one thing that really helps you grow and improve yourself and continue to push improving yourself because you're always going to meet Somebody that knows more than you do, that is better than you at what you do, and you should push to be better than them. Yeah. Not in a in a in a prideful, arrogant way, but you know, get past hey, get to the point where they're looking at you in the same way that you looked at them. Yeah. Like, I want to be like that guy. Well, I want to be like that guy. I think you should you should push and, just to find those people in general. Like if if you, Absolutely. for whatever reason, are the best in town or in your shop or whatever your circle is, expand out and try to find those people that are better than you because they're out there. No matter who you are, they're out there. You want those people in connection with you in your life somehow because it's only going to make you better just by default, just by being around them and knowing them. It will make you better. So no matter what level you're at, you should go find those people. Yeah, you're, you know, they say you're a product of the environment that you put yourself in. So um, if you put yourself in an environment of people wanting to learn, you're you're going to have, uh, you're going to develop the tendency to learn. Um, I listen to a lot of Dave Ramsey and, you know, he says, if you want to be a millionaire, you know, hang out with millionaires. Sure. Because you're, you're going to learn the way they do things and you do that, you'll get to the same point. So it's, it's all in what you want to be and surround yourself with like-minded people and that have the same goal and share the same uh, traits and, and desires and stuff that you enjoy. Um, you mentioning that the whiteboard deal and just a variety of possibilities made me instantly think of uh, a vehicle went and looked at today. Um, for a guy that he called me, he got my number for somebody else. And his, uh, he had a personal Jeep that the engine had been replaced. And ever since, ever since an engine replacement happened, it's had this ongoing issue of a, it would start up fine cold. It would run after a few minutes of running, it'd start developing a misfire and running worse and worse and worse and eventually stall. And if it's set for a few minutes, cool down, start up, it'll do that same sequence. Well, you know what? I went into it kind of dreading, like, what am I going to find? Is this thing going to be hacked up? And Because apparently a lot of parts have been sung at this thing before. I didn't know what I'm going to find. Don't know what I'm going to do. But I have to keep 
my, anytime I'm going to something like that, just keep the same mindset, go down your workflow. First things first, pre-scan, do a visual inspection, mm -hmm. look for anything that's off, um, follow the same routine. And that's what I did in this case. Um, what seemingly I was expecting to be a complicated issue, um, turned into a pretty quick diagnosis by just looking at some data, um, not scan data, mm -hmm. but there wasn't anything visible in scan data going on. So I grabbed the scope and, um, it was setting some, uh, it was setting primary circuit faults for all, it had the, the coil pack, the coil, what they call the coil rail on that one. Okay. And that one long single ignition coil and a certain primary circuit faults for all three coils. It's like, well, that ain't right. Um, and it was also setting a, um, intermittent loss, a cam crank signal. So I wanted to look at inputs and this was, this was my process, you know, trash in, trash out kind of thing. So grabbed a couple of test leads, fired scope up and within a few minutes got to, uh, got to stall, analyze the capture. Now this is where the whiteboard thing would kind of come in. Mm -hmm. Um, my first thought was this thing's got a bad crank sensor. And then I got thinking, well, that might not be the case. Might be something else because this thing had already had three other crank sensors put in it. Okay. The same concern. Like, well, maybe that's not it. What I noticed was in, based on the cam crank correlation, which the correlation was fine, there was one part of that, that four sector, you know, CKP trace window from the, um, from the flywheel flex plate. There was one of those windows that every two, it started out every two revolutions, it would have the same pattern. Okay. And then those other sections where you could tell it was one full crank revolution, but it was always in the same, the same window on that, that flex plate mm. where instead of the proper amount of pulses that would go from, it would have one, the very first one would be wide and extremely narrow. Um, it was always like it was broken up, like something was changing. Okay. And I, I went down the rules of possibilities or rolled out some possibilities. Is it a crank sensor breaking down? Then I thought, no, because it would be doing it more random instead of perfectly the same place every single time. Right. So I rolled out, I, I rolled out the crank sensor as a fault. Then I got thinking, well, maybe it's, maybe it didn't set the air gap because those, those ones go on the bell housing and have the little felt washer that spaces at 40 thousandths. And then as soon as the crank spins, it wipes it off. Sure. Maybe that's the case. Well, it still wouldn't cause the problem it has in the same exact spot unless that air gap was changing between the flex plate and the sensor. Mm. And the fact that this didn't start until the engine had been pulled and replaced. Mm. Um, I looked at the guy and I told him, look, here's, here's where I'm at. Um, I'm confident in saying that the flex plate area of this, where those reluctor windows are one in particular is bent slightly. And as it warms up, that metal is expanding a little bit and then the air gaps changing in that one particular spot. Sure. So I ruled out a bunch of stuff and the fact that it started up and ran perfectly smooth, um, took a lot of stuff off the table, but I was working my way down that whiteboard in my mind of what could possibly be wrong with this one. Mm -hmm. And then you know, a few minutes later and some deciphering, arguing with myself a little bit, <laughs> I said, this is, this here isn't the problem but this here looks like it is. So I'm going with this and, um, they're going to, I guess tomorrow, I'll pull it inside and get on a rack, pull the starter off and go around and inspect that, uh, that flex plate. But I told them there's going to be one area and it's the, the leading window of that section where they're going to find the problem. Mm -hmm. Like it's not perfectly, it's not perfectly, um, a smooth or radius anymore. Something's changed. Mm -hmm. It's been, I, I'd say it's been hit. Yeah. Um, caught on something when they're pulling out or putting Dan. Um, but yeah, something, there's something varying 
in that air gap and it's happening in the same spot every revolution, just one spot. And, you know, go back 15 years ago. Uh, I've been in the field 18 years now. And if I went back 15 years, there's no way at all that I would be able to make that call confidently. Right. And to be able to do that and, and look them straight in the face when, you know, this thing's been worked on for three or four months at two or three different shops and they can't fix it to tell them that the fix is something that simple and not be nervous about it. Yeah. That takes a lot. That takes a, a lot of, um, I'll say knowledge or skills, whatever you want to call it, but you have to have that foundation. You have to have that ability to be confident in what you say, believe in yourself and make those hard calls when they, when they happen. Yeah. Uh, confident in your testing methods and results too is so big, right? Taking the time beforehand, before you ever got to that car to analyze crank waveforms and, and look at what's good, what's normal, what's bad. Um, all that leads into that moment where you can say for sure that, yeah, you got to take this thing apart and here's what you're almost definitely going to find it is this, um, stuff like, um, I, yeah, I had, a, I had a cracked flywheel on an old caravan the other day. Um, you know, same thing based off of some testing, I can confidently say you got to pull that tranny. It's going to be cracked. And I, I don't have to be concerned about it anyway. Like, because, because I'm confident in my test results. And then that is because I spent the time beforehand learning from everybody and going to classes and doing it myself or heck, maybe even making a bad call here or there, but <laughs> that's, that's where it's at. That confidence to look at that test and just be like, yep, that's, that's what it is. That's huge. And that's what, um, well, a lot, a lot of people are missing that don't do this stuff on a regular basis. Yeah. Um, there are, everybody's going to have their own like favorite type of things they like to do. Like I know a lot of people that work more on crossers or more on GMs, more on Fords, more on Asian stuff than anything. I've got the longest, uh, record or not of anybody. I mean, myself, um, I've spent more time under the hood of Ford products than anything else. So I've become more familiar with those. Um, I can look at a screenshot of a cam crank waveform of a 543 valve. And I'll, I love those vehicles. I love those engines because they've, they've paid a lot of my more. <laughs> and that and six O's I'll, I'll take a five, four or a six O power stroke any day. Come on. <laughs> um, but you know, just being able to take a look at a screenshot of, you know, crankshaft to both cam sensors and just within five minutes or less confidently tell somebody, Hey, this thing's out of time. we just put time and chains in it, put it together. It's out of time. Got to tear it back apart. Yep. And breaking it down to the degree and to the tooth, you know, is it one tooth off of the crank? Is it one tooth off of the cam or is it, you know, three teeth off total one cam or a two cam, one crank? Um, yeah. Whatever. You look like a magician. You look like a magician when you do that, right? You're like, yeah, it's, it's this many teeth yeah. off or whatever. When, if you understand it, okay, it's just some, some math and we'll do a little bit of division here. Um, but you can do that if you understand what you're looking at, if you're taking that time to, to <laughs> really get it. Yeah, that's, I mean, I'm going back to, um, going back to fifth grade, you, you mentioned math. Um, I've always just enjoyed numbers. So that's where my nerd side came out. Okay. I, uh, I, we didn't mention this up front, but when I was a, when I was a kid, I lost my brother when I was nine years old. He died in a motorcycle wreck mm. and I was in fourth grade. So I went through a phase where I was kind of a, just a turd of a kid and just get in trouble. I, I guess I was lashing out. Um, we all go through that phase, I guess. Some do, some don't. But I went through this phase where I was getting in trouble a lot and there was finally in fifth grade, a teacher that didn't put up with my, uh, with my crap. Um, I remember it was my math teacher and, uh, it got to the point where I was causing so much trouble in this class. I would walk in and he's like, Daryl, go sit in the hallway. 
class hadn't even started. Yet. <laughs> I just walked in the front in the in the classroom door. He just wasn't, you know, wasn't going to put up with me that day. And that's when, you know, I really started. I noticed I had a lot of respect for that guy. Okay. And uh, um, I started listening to him, and then I, I, you know, stopped my my misbehaving and really got involved with uh, with math and. And then it kind of progressed from there and I uh, went into advanced math class and I was taking high school classes in eighth grade year. Um, I had all my, my math electives uh, done before into sophomore year of high school. And um, I just enjoy numbers. And now going back, I'm, I'm glad I did. And I'm glad I got to experience that because in this industry, doing what we do, looking at cam timing, looking at, um, pressure transducer waveforms looking at doing valve positions and, and openings and separating degrees we're dealing with tons of numbers and we've got to know how to put those numbers together to have them make sense yep and i'm glad i went through that and i'm glad he didn't put up with my garbage and was stern enough to let me know that and at some point we we have to be that way um to and you know let people know that we we do respect them but you're going to respect me back as well that's something you don't see a lot but there's a right way to do it and wrong way to do it yeah 100 percent. that's what i was going to say the same thing is you can go you can go overboard or you can do it in the wrong way at the wrong time but done right um some some people really need that um i know at the the school i'm at the um uh, the vibe is that that's not what they really push from administration is, is to be you know hard on the students and, and there's certain students that that's not necessarily going to benefit them maybe they're already hard on themselves but there are definitely and I was one of them that's why I know there are definitely students that go through that need that push they, they need somebody to make them better and tell them hey you you're not you're not giving it your all. You're not doing your best. You can do better. So just do it. Right. Um, you can't handhold them the right. whole way. Cause it's not going to help them in the long run. No, you hold their hand. They're going to not going to really learn anything. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, speaking of learning stuff, you were at, uh, the conference in North Carolina last month. What'd you think? Oh, that was a great event. It was, nice to be back and seeing other people you know face to face met a lot of people that i had talked to through groups and never seen them face to face yet um guys like cody and and brian good and mario and pj and um a lot of those talk to phone you know facetime facebook groups whatever but just never never met in person they were shook their hand and um other people got to meet Brandon Steckler and Jim Morton. Mm -hmm. um, seen a bunch of faces I've wanted to see for a while, talk to them, say hi. And it was just, it was a wonderful event. I, I didn't want it to be over. I, I wish it was longer and could have taken a whole lot more classes. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I, this might just be my perspective, but I feel like in the last two years, you know, since COVID kicked off and we haven't had any in-person training, I feel like the the industry, or at least the area that we focus on with training and diagnostics and all that stuff has, has really grown because like you say, it, we've been doing this for a long time. I mean, both of us, we've been in it for a while, but there's all these people that we've never met before. And at this one event, got to meet so many people face to face. Uh, it's just like, wow, the last two mm -hmm. years, I've really actually connected with quite a few new people um, that I didn't know before. Um, so it's, it's it's cool. And I, I hope it keeps going. And I think I think Vision will be the next big one. I know they have uh, it was it Apex going on next week, but I wasn't able to make that happen. So Yeah, like the first, first week of November out in Vegas, mm -hmm. right? Yep. I remember uh, the, what I remember from meeting you is your shirt, your uh, your PicoScope <laughs> shirt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was Star Wars uh, and PicoScope all in one. Nobody appreciates that at home, so I had to wear it there. 
<laughs> oh yeah, that's that's what I'll always remember. I didn't see your name tag at first. Like, the shirt. Yeah, <laughs> and then then I see your name, like, hey, I know this guy. And you, uh, you had a Scanner Danner shirt on, if I remember right. Yeah. Yeah, I was uh, I was excited about that. I finally, I'd ordered it and it finally showed up and um, that and I had some, uh, some other shirts I, I enjoy wearing and I ended up getting an extra of the AST shirt and I was one of, I think, three people on their entire list that got a, a second shirt. I was kind of surprised. Oh, wow. Um. But no, it was a it was a great event. I took uh, Friday morning took Isaac's uh, hybrid class, and then that yeah. evening, uh, that afternoon, um, was in. What was that? That afternoon. That was Justin Morgan's that afternoon. That was a, that was a Saturday. Oh, okay. Um. Jim, I had Jim Morton Saturday morning. I think, I guess Scott Brown's was, uh, was the afternoon class on that Friday. I think that's right. Okay. Uh, f- I'm trying to remember schedule my head. Um, that Scott Brown's class was probably the one I got the most, um, in a way to, to say it out of mm-hmm. because, or one that stuck with me the most because it was, more of a surprise from what I was expecting to what was delivered. You know, I'm thinking, you know, engine calibrations class, this thing's going to be, or this class is going to be about checking a calibration ID and comparing a ways to compare to, uh, to current or available. Is there an update or what does it fix? But no, it was, it was complete, uh, turn of events from what I was expecting. And it was a good turn, um, using, if I allow HP tuners and in, in ways that I hadn't really thought of, I've got HP tuners in PVI two. Um, I got back in May learning that tool. Great tool. Mm-hmm. And just talking about different ways to utilize that different strategies. It was that, that was a great class. Um, I really enjoyed that. Uh, Justin Morgan's on Saturday, um, his BMW one one class. That was, that was another good one. Um, because European honestly is the is a weak link for me uh, experience wise um in the shops I've been in it's mainly been Asian and domestic mm-hmm. that's about it with, yeah, with same the casual here. May, maybe an Audi here and there um maybe a Mercedes serpentine belt or a, or a pulley that's came apart at some <laughs> sure. point um BMWs that may have a misfire, but that's that's really about all I, you know, did. Maybe some suspension parts, but I never never really had to do any very deep diagnosis or repairs on on pretty much anything European. Um, probably done more repairs on Sprinters than I have uh, a Mercedes Benz product or BMW or Audi. Um, I should probably get more time on Volvo and Sprinter than anything else in the European world. All right. So, but, um, yeah, that's, that's one area I definitely need more, more training, more experience in to feel more comfortable. Yeah. You and me both. <laughs> um, so, but I'm not afraid to, to admit that when, you know, somebody has a question, I know who I can go to because networking with a great group of guys, I've got people that I can ask Mm -hmm. and say, Hey, this, this was asked to me. I don't know how to answer it. Here's the information I got. What's your input? And it just goes from there. So being able to take Justin's class and and deciphering that, that coding, um, of the BMW or the, uh, uh, yeah, the BMW ger- uh, terminology, mm-hmm. it sure made things a whole lot, a whole lot simpler than, yeah. than I was making it out to be. Well, yeah, just some of the, the numbers and the acronyms and, and stuff like that is what throws me off a lot of the time. Uh, just trying to read a track diagram and the, you know, to J29 or, or even just the frame or the engine where that's a, 229.1 or whatever, you know, and people are talking about those on Facebook. I'm like, well, and they know what it is, right? It's like a, 
I'm trying to think of something now off the top of my head, like a Z71 Chevy pickup truck, right? That's the RPO code. Of course, I know what a Z71 is because I've seen it a gazillion times, and yep. that's that's that for them. They they know a 229.1. They know exactly. That's a poof in their mind. They know what it is. <laughs> I have no idea what they're talking about because I'm I'm so unfamiliar. But yeah, class like that would be huge just to get yourself up on the terminology. You know, you're you're five steps ahead at that point. I had. Uh... I'll say one point and then I'll, I'll, I kind of step back in the timeline a little bit. I've got some friends that work for BMW and Mercedes a long time and trying to have conversations with them. And like, is it a, like on BMW N54, is it a, you know, this, this N54 engine? Okay. Mm-hmm. I don't, I didn't really know what that was or like my Mercedes buddy, you know, it's a 212 chassis. What kind of car is that? <laughs> yep. And I'm, I'm over here thinking, you know, I can tell you what a 543 valve is. Yeah, five four three valve. Uh huh. <laughs> yep. Um, but just it's it's amazing how different the the terminology and the communication is with those, and um, it's definitely a different environment. So, um, where's that going with that? Going back. Oh, I lost a train of thought. Lost train of thought. Yeah, no big deal. It happens. Um, <laughs> it'll uh, hit. It'll hit me here in a few minutes. I had had something good. Oh man! Um, it'll I'll, I'll think. I'll yeah, think it later. it'll it'll pop but, back in. Um, yeah, I should have done that first. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> I, I I do a, a ton a ton of the the six L eighties and six L nineties to the point where I even know the RPO codes for the transmissions now and. It, but again, it's only because I've seen it so many times. So if somebody says an MYC, like, I know that's the eight-speed transmission. That's it. I don't have to go to the glove box. I don't have to look through all this stuff. I, I know just because it's repetition, it's seeing it over and over and over again, where somebody's just jumping into it. I don't know what that means. Um, yeah. And that's all it is. Familiar, familiarizing yourself with what you're working on in a class like that's the way to do it. So you're not trying to do it on the job. You just got it. You got maybe a reference material to a book to go along, something you make notes with, and then you keep it in your toolbox or something. And boy, that'll make your life a lot easier. Yeah, absolutely. Um, speaking of making your life a lot easier, I remember what I was going to say now. Okay. Is um, when I was when I was in NASCAR Tech, they have... When I was, I was closing in towards the end of my time there, you know, I'd worked really hard. Um, 4.0 GPA, nearly perfect attendance. I had three tardies because I was like a max of like five minutes late. That was mm. my worst late I'd ever been in the, what, the eight, 18 months I spent in class there. But um, I had applied to go into the BMW STEP program, um, the manufacturer training after graduating school. Well, I really wanted to go to that. And cause I've seen that as a, you know, a possible good career path. And I applied and got turned down. The reason being it had nothing to do with my grades. It was a fact that I had two moving violations on my driving record. Really? I had two speeding tickets. Um, when I was in high school, I was, I got two speeding tickets, uh, a little more than a month back, month apart. And it was before I moved. So, you know, go, this was, you know, fast forward a year and a half later without any more speeding tickets on my record. Those were still standing. Mm -hmm. I got denied an opportunity to go into a manufacturer training that could have that would have definitely took my career in a complete different direction. Yeah. And all because of a completely unrelated event here, you know, a couple of years before. Yeah. And then they said, if you, if you still want to go, you can try getting a, a sponsorship through a local dealership. So I went to the, I set up meetings with the, uh, the service manager, both at BMW of Docksville here, and then even the one all the way in Chattanooga, which is an hour and a half from here, and uh, went and talked to them, and neither of them would sponsor me for that program 
because of the moving violations. Really? I was a, what they called was a liability. Wow. I was considered, I was considered high risk. What year was this? I'm just curious. So, um, I got the tickets in 2003. Okay. Okay. Um, it was end of, let's see, around May and June. Was it? Yeah, I think it was May, May and June of, uh, of 03. Okay. Um, right around the time I graduated high school. And then I graduated NASCAR Tech December of 04. And so it was maybe about 14, 15 months after the speeding tickets when I was trying to get into the step program. And I got, deter- I got turned down because of those. So for the people listening to this, don't think that something um, like that won't, have, won't or can't affect the future because it, it definitely can. It did in my case. Yeah. And my career ended up going, you know, a different direction. Am I, you know, thankful for where I'm at right now? Absolutely. I don't know where I'd be at if that hadn't been the case. So, yeah. but, you know, I can't worry about that. I'm not worried about that. I'm, you know, I'm glad to be at where I'm at. Right. It's boy. So just, just, uh, just be conscious of the decisions you make. Um, cause they can change your, your whole career path in life that you don't see yet. Yeah. That's, that's very good advice for a young person is to, it's hard to when you're young, but you got to think about the, the long game and the, the big picture when you're doing stupid stuff that we all do when we're young. Um, <laughs> but at, at the same time, yeah, it's it's just it's so interesting to think how small decisions that you made one way or another completely change your trajectory and where you end up. And like as simple as applying for a job or taking one job over another. Like, you know, I I've had points in my career where it's like a 50, 50, I could go to either shop. I picked one that I went to and through a series of events, it led me to where I'm at now. What would I be doing had I went to the other shop? You know, would it be completely different? Would Mm -hmm. I be in a completely different spot? Would I have left the industry? Would I be making twice as much money? Who knows? Um, you can't, you can't, like you said, you can't worry about that stuff, but it's really interesting to think about uh, all the series of events that get you (laughs) right to where you're at at the moment. Um, and you don't, that hindsight 2020 kind of thing, you don't see these happening when they are happening. But if you look back, um, you can see, you'll notice a, a sequence that, that got you to where you are at this present time. And and I'm thankful for all the things I've been through and, and experienced and, and learned along the way. And at the same time, I still know that I've got a long ways to go. So I've tried to, I'm actively trying to teach myself new things. Um, I've got a lot of equipment right now that I use and use regularly. Um, learning more of the mobilizer stuff and, you know, the right way to do things and, mm-hmm. um, EPROM trying to teach myself more than that. So if I'm at a shop and they've got a junk module, I'll, uh, I'll say, Hey, do you, do you need that for anything? Cause in my mind, I'm thinking I need some, some board soldering, uh, practice yep. cause I'm going to need it later on and just got a, a hot air station. It arrived here a few days ago. Um, I've got that to, to learn and, uh, I got a good soldering station. Finally got a good hot air station. Okay. And just learning to do more, to make myself more valuable in the long run Yep. and, you know, have more skills because, you know, going back to the, the whole house, uh, show thing, you know, about, you know, if you can do what nobody else can do in your area, you're going to be busy. Mm Mm-hmm. And I love it when I get something or get brought into something that let's say, you know, four or five other people have looked at this and nobody's been able to fix it. Can, I don't, can you fix it? Can you do anything? Like they instantly have, have doubt. Mm-hmm. So if you, uh, if you want me to see you or I love when people doubt me cause that gives me a chance to prove them wrong. Sure. One thing. Not, not again, not in an arrogant way. It's just, if it's something that's in, in my, in my skill set, then I will, I will work hard to, 
to prove them wrong, not just for the fact of proving them wrong, but, you know, don't doubt people you don't know. I mean, you don't know what yeah. everybody else knows and, um, you're asking for help. So be a little bit humble about it. Yeah. Oh, and, 100% agree you know, with being, that. Being that go-to guy is, it is a good feeling, but again, I don't, I'm not going to be that go-to guy forever, you know, for the people I'm, I'm a go-to for now. I want to pass that on down to somebody else and, you know, let them be that as well. Mm -hmm. And it, it is enjoyable. So every, every skill that you can learn, um, every skill that you have an opportunity to learn, do it. Um, mm -hmm. and you know, my free time, I do, um, some woodworking stuff here as well. When I can, I haven't got to touch much of it in a while, but, uh, learning some of that side and, uh, some home projects and, you know, making things and, mm -hmm. um, I'm always trying to learn something, something new. How can I make myself more valuable and, um, make life a little bit, a little bit easier on myself. Yeah. That's kind of what I'm always after. Well, that's, uh, and that's a great goal for anybody. You just continually improve yourself. You never, you know, you shouldn't just ever be done, right? You should be able to look back, you know, on yourself five years, 10 years prior and say, wow, I'm in a way better spot here. I can do this much more, or I know this much more or whatever you've improved. You come a distance. If you're the same, if you're flat as five, 10 years ago, that's, that's an issue. That's a problem. Um, but I, I think one of the biggest ways to yeah, get I can, there, I can look somebody in yeah, I can look somebody in the face and um, just be honest with them and say, "Look, if you're if you're in the same place six months, a year from now, skill wise, and you haven't learned, you haven't grown, you haven't done anything new, that's your fault. Mm -hmm. You you should strive to learn something new, whether it be daily, weekly, monthly, something new. Learn, you know, challenge yourself." Yep. And always, always strive to be better tomorrow than you are today. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just a, just a little bit of encouragement for some people goes a long way. And sometimes that's all it takes. And they, they got to have somebody kicking their butt once in a while. Yep. And I, I'm not scared to do that. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, man. Well, I think that's a, that's a pretty good point to wrap this one up unless you got anything else specific for me no i i just really appreciate you letting me come on to the show it's been it's been good it's been a blast hopefully this isn't the last one <laughs> no no I, i'd be happy to have you back in at any <laughs> point you got any interesting case studies or anything you want to talk about um i mean oh, I'm, this always is... work, I'm always working on stuff so i'll uh i'll come up with something good and we'll we'll talk about it next time for sure. Yeah, this is an hour and a half, and it, it didn't feel like that at all. So <laughs> I like those ones. <laughs> okay, that's going to do it for today's episode. I want to give one more big thank you to Daryl for spending the time with me today. Like I said, I enjoyed that conversation quite a bit. Hopefully you did as well. But with that all out of the way, let's all get out there and start fixing the world one car at a time.